This is Dr. Minkoff. He's got a fantastic practice in Clearwater, and he does wonderful things to help many, many people in many different ways. Thank you. Do I? I've got the other one. <laughs> huh? Don't do both. Hi, good morning. Thank you for having me. I'm in Clearwater, Florida. Uh, I have a holistic medical practice there for the last 21 years. And um, I'm really into dental problems with my patients. And so um, I gave a lecture like this. I had a, a uh, dentist that came to me with severe chronic fatigue and she was unable to work for a couple of years. And she ended up coming to me as a patient. And after about six months, she was able to go back to work. And she was also the chairman of the Dental Society for Clearwater, Florida, for uh, St. Pete, Clearwater, Florida. And so she said to me, would you come talk to the dentists about how you utilize dentistry in helping your patients? And I said, I'm a little scared to go there, but I would go and I would talk to her, or talk to them. So I put together a PowerPoint presentation and I sent it over to her to make sure it was going to be okay. And she said, uh, I got to see you right away. <laughs> so she came up to see me and she said, listen, here's the problem. She said, you have a bus over here and they're in a different bus. And what we want them to do is walk from their bus to your bus but if you put the Grand Canyon in between, they're not gonna get off their bus. So the presentation was a little bit too much, so I toned it down, and I went and gave it to them, and uh, there was about 300 dentists in the room, and at the end of the presentation, there was kind of a stunned silence, and I thought, oh, it was still too deep, and I looked over at her, and she said, no, it's okay, and then one of the vendors put their hand up and said, you know, that was the best presentation trying to integrate medicine and dentistry that I've heard. And then it sort of opened up and everybody started to talk. A lot of it was on root canals and the problems with root canals. And the head at the University of South Florida, uh, the guy who, who teaches uh, root canal technology, the endodontist there, uh, he was the first one in line after the, after the talk, and he's a gigantic, imposing man. He's probably six foot eight, and I'm looking up at him, and he said, you know, that was really good. He said, most dentists doing root canals don't know how to do it. They don't have the proper equipment. They don't have the proper training, and a lot of them are bad. Uh, my message to them wasn't that every root canal should be pulled, but that dentists and, and doctors should work together for the betterment of the patient. So I want to present some cases to you today that have to do with this. Um, most doctors don't know anything about dentistry and don't want to. Um, and I think on the other side, dentists are too reticent to refer to medical doctors like myself to get help with patients when they actually see pathology. Um, doctors as a group are confused. Um, they tend to be very fearful about doing things exactly how the medical board says they should be done. Um, that used to bother me as a medical doctor, but I've gotten over it. When I started medical school, um, the uh, provost guy who was the head of the school, we called him Uncle Arvin, uh, he gave us a piece of information which has been helpful to me ever since. And he said, you're going to go on an experience for the next four years, which is going to be very interesting, and we're going to fill you up with all kinds of knowledge. He said, medical knowledge, medical data, is increasing at the rate of doubling every couple of years. And so there's new, and there's new, and there's new, and there's new. And he says, we're going to teach you the best that we know. But he said, only 50% of it is actually true. The biggest problem with that is, 
we don't know which 50%. And so, like with the radium this morning, it's perfect. You know, here's a new technology that kills people. And then here's another new technology that kills people. And so what I find, if we go back to tried and true things, like the body has a, an amazing intelligence, and if you give it the right things and you depoison it, it will come through and get better. But if you're too rough on it or you add things to it that maybe aren't good, you, you go backwards, you don't go forward. So what's the myth and what's the reality? That's the real question that all of us are grappling with, is like, what is the right thing to do so that you can help your patient the best? And it's very confusing sometimes. Now, I got here, uh, I had very traditional medical training. Um, I did a, a, a residency program at the UC San Diego in pediatrics, and I, did a, uh, I was chief resident there for a year. I did two years specialty training in infectious disease. Um, I ran a neonatal intensive care unit. I was a hospital control officer, infection control officer. And um, then I did full-time emergency medicine for about 15 years. So I've been in all areas of medicine. And uh, I started a wellness clinic in 1997 because uh, my wife got sick in 1996. My hobby is Ironman triathlons, so I've done 42 of them so far. I try to live the lifestyle that I'm telling other people to live because I'm interested in my own performance, and health is really performance, so uh, that goes really well. My wife is a, um, she's a registered nurse, and she was always into health ever since a young age. And she... Um, uh, is a podium triathlete. She's very talented. Uh, we had three children. We have three children. Um, and so she decided that because she was healthy and she had uh, large amalgam fillings in all of her molar teeth, that she would go to a dentist and get her, her amalgams out. And she went to a dentist in St. Pete, Florida, who used a high-speed drill and no protection and drilled all her mercury out. And a few weeks later, she started complaining to me that her thyroid was sore. And I'm an I was an emergency room doctor. I knew the best doctors in town. And I sent her to an endocrinologist. And he said, you have Hashimoto's thyroiditis. It's an autoimmune condition. We don't really understand why. Your thyroid function is OK, so there really isn't anything to do. A few weeks after that, she started to complain about her right upper quadrant like her liver was swollen, it was hurting, it wasn't very specific, and I sent her to a hepatologist, a liver specialist, the best guy in our area, and he evaluated her and he checked her for all kinds of liver viruses, she didn't have any, and then he checked her for her, her liver function tests, they were elevated, and he said, you probably have, along with an inflamed thyroid on an autoimmune basis, you probably have an autoimmune uh, hep hepatitis on an autoimmune basis, and again, we're not sure why this happens, but you're not symptomatic other than the pain, and we'll just watch you. And then a few weeks later, uh, I hear her call from the bathroom that she can't lift up her arm, her deltoid muscle on one side was weak, and she was limping a little bit, and her gluteus maximus muscle was also weak. And of course, being a dutiful husband, I sent her to the best neurologist in the area, and he did a C, an MRI scan of her brain, and he said, it looks like this is compatible with MS. It's an autoimmune disease, which has just happened because of the same thing that happened to your thyroid and your liver, and you should go on high-dose steroids and interferon so that we can block these symptoms before it gets worse. And I didn't know anything about any of this, but I was sure this wasn't right. And there had to be a reason for this, and that I had to find it out because there was nobody there who was gonna find it out. And my wife owns a home healthcare nursing agency, and she, in her area where her office is, a new person moved in, and on the marquee, it said, natural dentistry. And one night, practically by accident, if there are such things, I was, driving over to pick her up, and he was walking out of his office, and I said, excuse me, could I talk to you? I told him the whole story, amalgams out, 
uh, thyroiditis, hepatitis, MS, do you, do you, does this make any sense to you? And he said, oh yes, she's mercury toxic. When he drilled the mercury out, it got into her nervous system, she swallowed some, it affected her liver, and it affected her thyroid, and that's what's wrong, but there's nobody in this town that's gonna help you. You better go to Seattle, Washington, there's a guy there that does courses, and he'll teach you what to do. So I got on a plane, and I went to Seattle, and I learned how to approach this from a very non-standard way. And I came home and did the program on her, and within about three months, her symptoms were gone, and she felt great, and she was actually mercury toxic. And we had friends who were watching this whole process, and they saw her get better, and they said, well, I've got chronic migraines, and I've got rheumatoid arthritis, and I've got irritable bowel disease, and can you help me? And I was in the emergency room at shift work, so it's 12-hour shifts, three or four days a week. I had a couple days in the office that, that uh, I was free. And in her nursing agency, she had an extra office. And uh, I said, sure, come on in. I'm just going to play. And I didn't charge anybody, but I learned a lot. And people started to get better. And this got so interesting. And by that time, the emergency room had turned into a drug seeker clinic and a psych screening clinic. And when a, a six-year-old was brought in by a 300-pound cop in, in handcuffs, uh, because he had had some kind of episode at school where he'd, where he'd acted out, uh, and he was going to be Baker acted, which in Florida means it's an involuntary commission to the psych ward. And when his mother came in and I said, really, this is not a good idea. Why don't you take him home and maybe you can get some kind of counseling and help him out? And she said, oh, no, he's going to the psych ward. And that ended my emergency room career because I just couldn't deal with that and I started to practice this kind of medicine. Now, this medicine is a paradigm shift. It's a, it's a very different way of looking at the world. Whoops. Now, that looks like a frog when you look at it first. When you look at it turned, it's a horse. It's a paradigm shift. The information is there. But what you see is based on what you see but it can be seen differently and still make sense and maybe do better. So I think the most important thing that I've learned along this line is that the mouth is really part of the body and it's the most intimately connected anatomical area to the central nervous system and the autonomic nervous system. This is the key place where everything runs through. And that if you have occult dental pathology, occult meaning it's not apparent, the patient's not complaining, there's no pain, you can't see anything, you can still have a systemic effect from this and it can be profound. Most medical doctors don't know anything about dentistry and this is true of most dentists as well as most doctors. If it looks okay and it doesn't hurt, you're fine. It doesn't matter that there's an abscess sitting there three inches from your brain that's putting out very potent biotoxins and, and, and fungal toxins. It looks okay, you're fine. And the whole approach to root canals that they're doing is if we kill the tooth so you won't feel it, we can leave everything there intact and you'll be fine. And we're not going to follow up on these patients at all because why should we? It looks okay, and you're not complaining. The hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, um, uh, Lyme disease, cancer, it couldn't be related to that. How do we know? We just know, and we're not going to look. The, um, the question, I think, to ask, both from a doctor point, uh, viewpoint and from a dentist viewpoint, is... Could the body be affecting the teeth and could the teeth be affecting the body? Because it can go both ways. And that's really important. And that the best diagnostics, the, both the dentist and the doctor, have to be really good diagnosticians to figure out what is actually going on. Now, one of the things I resorted to is that, I can't show you this film, but you're probably aware of it. About 5% of dental offices have cone beam CTs in their office. 
And I don't think a dentist can practice good medicine today unless they have one in their office. The dentist that I work with now, and I send him between eight and 10 patients a week, literally. I have built two dental practices so far. Because all the sick people I see have dental problems, and they're never going to get better unless I find a dentist that can help me out. If you're a dentist and you want to move to Clearwater and you know how to do this, I want you to come up to me afterwards because I'm looking for another dentist, okay? Now, the dentist that I'm using now, I sent him about a half a dozen people where on energetic testing, the thing that looked the worst on the person was either jawbone osteitis, some kind of cavitational osteitis, or root canal toxicity. And he dutifully did a good exam. It looked fine. The patient had no complaints pertaining to the teeth. And he did his 2D normal x-ray, and he didn't see anything. And he said, I just don't see anything. I don't think I can help the patient. Fast forward about six months later, he decided to get into implant dentistry. And as part of implant dentistry, he, he had to get a cone beam CT in his office so that he could get uh, three-dimensional views of what he was doing. And when he did that, he came and told me. And I said, would you just do me a favor? Because I'd learned in the meantime that, that on a 3D x-ray, you could see things that you couldn't see on a 2D x-ray. And I said, would you bring back those six patients and re-x-ray them? Do the cone beam CT on them and tell me what you see. And bingo, six out of six had abscesses that could be seen on the cone beam that weren't seen on the 2D x-ray. And that made a believer out of him. And then he went and got all the training that you guys have had so that he could be a good dentist and do all the stuff that I need to do. So this is really important. And I think if you're going to do this work, invest in it, you will make money back. I, he charges $318 for a, C, uh, for a cone beam CT on everybody I sent there, and I've bought him two machines so far. So you, you will make up the, the, the investment of what it is. Now here's the other thing. All sick patients have autonomic nervous system dysfunction. This is what is wrong with them. 99% of the body, probably 99.99999% of the body is controlled by your autonomic nervous system. Now if you go to a, like the most smartest computer scientist in the world, and you present him with this problem. If we took a skin cell and biopsied it, we could grow it up in tissue culture. You could take a brain cell or a liver cell or a lung cell, and you could do the same thing. You could do a biopsy, you could grow it in tissue culture. It is a living, independent life form, one cell. That cell is really busy. It's making ATP every, every second. It's keeping its cell membrane um, uh, well energized. It is taking in nutrients. It is putting out toxins. And it's estimated that there are about 2,000 reactions per second going on in every individual cell in your body. Now, it's estimated that somewhere between 100 and 150 trillion cells make up a human body. And if you count the gut, it's probably 10 times that. So now you say to the computer scientist, I need a program that's going to run a cell at 2,000 times per second reaction rate, and I've got 150 trillion of them, and I have to run them all together at the same time so that we can control and change everything on a nanosecond basis so that whether we're at the top of Mount Everest or with the Dead Sea, whether it's cold or it's hot, or you're sleeping or you're awake, you get complete coordination of all this action all the time. And it's an impossible project. How the body does it, no one has any idea, not any idea or clue at all. There is some kind of a laser system that is able to communicate and feedback all the time so the information gets out and when you take a step forward, it all just kind of happens. This is all run by an autonomic nervous system. We live in a sea of toxins and infections, and they get in us from the food and our cosmetics and the water and the air, and it gets in our system and it affects the autonomic nervous system. 
It to some extent poisons it or impairs it. It's just like a computer has an operating system and you get a virus in there or some kind of sp spyware or malware and that computer, you go to push send on your email and the little circle goes around and around and around and around and it won't send because it's blocked by some other kind of program or some toxin or some virus and the same thing happens in us. And we each have our own sort of genetic ability to deal with environmental toxins and depending on our diet and our environment, some of us can survive and actually at the present time, most of us aren't surviving. We know that diseases that people used to get when they're 40 and 50, the children are getting at eight to 10. You know, type two diabetes and obesity and cancer in eight and 10 year olds are just skyrocketing uh, because they're poisoned. Their mothers are poisoned. They dump in utero to the babies, the babies come out, you know, they get 26 vaccines in the first year of life, they're poisoned. And, they're, and, they, and, they, and, the, and their autonomic nervous systems are poisons, and then, their, then function isn't right. So that's the kind of problem that we have. And so fatigue and high blood pressure and low thyroid and insomnia and anxiety, these are all symptoms of a messed up autonomic immune system. I think that the acupuncture meridian system is really, it's, 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 a, it's an early version of what the autonomic nervous system is. You know, if you cut the autonomic nerves coming from large intestine one, large intestine one does not communicate and it doesn't work. So it's a physical system and, um, and if we're gonna get people healthy or maintain health or get optimum performance, we have to be able to get in touch with that autonomic nervous system so that we can actually fix it and find out what's going on. It is known now that the autonomic nervous system has various things that are inputs to it. So just simple things like physical, like you do a deep tendon reflex, you, f you physically stimulate it, and then you get a reaction. But you get a reaction from a kiss or from a horrid movie. Just think what happens for a minute if you, some, if you see something very beautiful, all the things that get changed in your body. Or you see someone get hit by a car, and autonomically what happens? You get nauseous, you throw up, you get a headache, you might even faint yourself. So the autonomic nervous system, the unconscious nervous system, is actually the only part of our nervous system which is never unconscious. It's always on, it's always recording, it's always getting information, and it's always running things. And if as practitioners, we're not accessing that and tuning into that, we're not gonna be as good of a doctor. So there's biochemical inputs, pesticides or biotoxins. Um, there's energetic inputs. You know, on my physical exam, I shine the light in the person's eye and their pupil constricts. It's an energetic input. And we're getting energetic inputs all the time from our environment and from the people in our environment and from everywhere we go. We're a walking antenna, we're, we're a walking antenna which feeds into our autonomic nervous system. All psychosomatic illnesses, autonomic nervous system triggers. You have some earlier experience, it was a bad one, uh, it's logged in there, and now, now you, you get stressed again, and now you get an ulcer, or you get colitis, or you get chronic migraine headaches, or whatever it is. It's all the same stuff. So we can't ignore the autonomic nervous system because it's the most critical part of our physical examination. Now, medicine has this concept of referred pain which is you have a pain felt in your head, but really it came from your neck. Or you have a pain in your low back and it came from something else. And doctors are very comfortable with referred pain, okay? And I'm just extending this to what about just calling it referred malfunction or referred symptom? Because that's really what it is. And these are autonomic pathways that are connected two things, and they cause the symptoms that the person has. So dental pathology may be the source of autonomic nervous system function because so much of it is oriented in the, in the mouth. The, the, the uh, trigeminal nerve is the biggest nerve root in the body. It goes, it's the, you know, if you look at the homunculus on the brain, the jaw and the hands are, are huge parts of the brain anatomically that take up so much space and it's because there's so much connection there. So then I just asked the question, wouldn't it be logical to consider or related pathology as a possible source of systemic or peripheral disease or dysfunction? And of course the Chinese worked this out a long time ago. 
you know, incisor teeth are bladder, are bladder meridian, and, um, and canine teeth are liver spleen meridian, and on the top, the premolar teeth are, are, um, are colon, lung, uh, large intestine meridian, and the molar teeth on the top are stomach meridian, stomach spleen meridian, and on the bottom it switches a little bit, but as Blanche was talking about this morning, these things connect, and they often connect pretty routinely, okay? So my clinic, we see a lot of patients with cancer and with breast cancer, and probably 75% of the time, the breast cancer has pathology on their stomach meridian teeth. Molars on the top and premolars on the bottom. It's, all, it's almost routine. They never get better if you don't fix that. They never get better. They will not overcome their cancer. They will not get better from Lyme disease. They won't get better. They, this has to be fixed. It is always the most important thing. If you'd examine someone autonomically, you do electrodermal screening, or you're a good muscle tester, or you have a, uh, a what is it, Zyto machine or something like that. Some way where you can autonomically check in with a patient. In my experience, the dental stuff, when it's there, is always at the top of the list. And, it'll, and they don't get better unless you fix it. One of the Google executives sent his wife to me. She, uh, they're out in California, we're in Florida. She came to see me. Uh, she had four abscessed implants, and she had five abscessed root canal teeth. And she's got stage one breast cancer. She's got a lump. It got removed before I saw her. They told her she was fine. She didn't need anything else. When she came to see me on my autonomic testing, she tested as, as root canal. And I sent her to my dentist, and he did the x-ray, and it was a complete mess. Now she'd had, uh, all of her teeth had been, had been veneered and looked beautiful, but the thing was a complete mess. And he called her oral surgeon in California who had done the work and said, I, I think something should be done. And the oral surgeon said, yes, something should be done. All these teeth should be pulled because it's, it's, it, there's no way to reverse all this. And she was adamant that she wasn't going to get her teeth pulled. She was going to die with her dead teeth if that's what it took. And she did die with her dead teeth because she didn't do it. I did our program on her. We fixed everything else. We fixed her gut and her hormones and her mineral deficiencies and all her viruses. And one year later, she starts coughing and she gets a CAT scan and she's got metastases in her lungs and there was just no way that anybody could do anything for her. But she did have her bad teeth, okay? And I consider this sort of malpractice and very serious if this isn't looked at because it's so, so important. So I think as a dentist and as a doctor, you've got to learn how to do some kind of autonomic nervous system testing. In our, in our city, there's, a, there's a, a, a chiropractor there who's got a school to teach you muscle testing in three days. It's Ulan Nutrition Systems. He's a good guy. You can learn it. You have to, have to, have to have a tool that in your office you can do this. And here's an analogy for you, which, which, which when I tell patients makes sense. You and I are very good hunters, and we're walking in the jungle with our M16 rifles, and in the little clearing in front of us, we see a maiden laying unconscious on the ground of the jungle floor. And we can see almost automatically that there's a great big black bad uh, panther that's about ready to bite her leg in half. And then we do a double take and we look and we see there's a boa constrictor that's wrapped around her abdomen ready to squeeze her to death. And then we look again and we see that there's a family of black widow spiders walking up her arm. And on the other side, there's um, African flesh-eating red ants <laughs> walking up the other arm. And the question is, you're the hunter, what do you shoot first? <laughs> now most people say the panther, but I had a patient this week say, no, because he could take her leg and she'd be okay, but if the bow constrictor squeezed the person, then they would die right away. It doesn't matter. The, the point is 
There is a priority in treating patients. There's a right way to where do you go in. I had a lady a couple years ago come in, and she went to her alternative medicine doctor, and, he, and she was feeling fatigued, and she wasn't doing very well, and he tested her, and as part of his battery of tests, he did an EDTA challenge on her, and she had high mercury levels and lead levels in her, uh, in her body that came out in her urine, and so he decided that he should do chelation therapy on her. So he gave her e IV EDTA, and she promptly went from a very successful 15-people real estate office that she owned into a bag lady, literally a bag lady, walking around with headphones and religious music, carrying two paper bags with her clothes in it, and not knowing, having a clue of where she was or who she was or where she was supposed to go. It took me three years to unwind that. What happened? She had a bad gut. She had deficiencies. She had problems with her hormones. She had a liver that was already overloaded, couldn't keep up with the toxin load. He gave her EDTA. It pulled the lead and the mercury out of her bones where it was nicely staying, and it floated around, and when it couldn't be detoxified from her liver, it ended up in her brain. So there is a right way to do things, just like there's a right way to start a car. If you put the key in and you turn the ignition and there's gas, it will go. If you kick the tires or you twist the steering wheel, the car won't start. And I think there's a right way to approach a sick person or even a healthy person who's asymptomatically sick with what is the priority? Where do you go? And if you check autonomically, the body gives you the pathway. It just gives you the pathway, boom, 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 and you will solve the case. Here's another example of that. I have a lady from Texas come to Florida. She has chronic Lyme disease. She was fatigued, she wasn't doing well, and we treated her, her, her priority when we started was of some infections and some toxins and Lyme disease, and we treated all this stuff. And after, you know, she's getting IVs three or four days a week. She's a, it's an intense treatment program that she did. And at the end of that time, she said, I, I brought her in because we had finished the treatment program that I'd, I'd set up for her. And I was just talking with her, how are you doing? She says, well, I'm doing way better than I was, but I'm not there. I'm not really there. And I was hoping before I go home that I'd, I'd be there. Great. Go up on the table. I retest her. I re-autonomically test her. I use autonomic response testing. It's, you can learn it. And what came up as the autonomic priority on her at that time was measles vaccine virus. So I looked at her and I said, it's measles vaccine virus. And she started to laugh. She says, well, my profession is I sell large medical equipment to hospitals. And I get measles titers done every year because I'm not allowed to not be immune to measles. And if I don't have good antibodies, which she didn't, because she wasn't good at making antibodies to measles virus, they revaccinate me. So I said, okay, we're going to treat this because this is what came up now. And I couldn't find any Lyme or Epstein-Barr or the rest of the junk that, that she had had. It looked like those had cleared out. So we made a homeopathic remedy a 10-vial homeopathic remedy for measles vaccine virus. And the first dilution is 5x, and it goes 8x and 10x, and it goes up to 200x. So it's a Thursday afternoon. I, I give her the remedies. I have her take the first one that night, and she calls me up on Friday morning, and she says, I think you're trying to kill me. What's wrong? I've got a fever of 102, I've got red spots all over me, my eyes are burning and I'm coughing. Come in. I look at her. She looks like she's got an acute measles infection. I used to be a pediatric infectious disease specialist. I know this stuff. So I said, good, it's the perfect remedy. You're going to be sick for a while. Don't take the next vial, the higher, the, the, the more stronger vial, until this is settled down. And she was really sick for about three weeks. And after three weeks, she came back in, and I said, how are you doing? She says, no, I'm well. 
I'm ready to go home. This was sitting there underneath of it all as sort of the last straw for her autonomic nervous system. And once that lifted, now the system kind of goes on. The lights turn on, the communication goes back in, and now things are working, and now she feels good. And she went home, and I follow her up every three months. She's doing fine. She's back to work. She's fine. She's exercising. If you look on her website, she, she said she, she, she's, she's beautiful. And she came, she, at, on the exit interview, I videoed her. And she said, you know, I came in here and I was a total dodo. And she says, now I can exercise a half an hour a day. I can work. I'm feeling great. My pain is all gone. I'm doing great. A regular doctor not doing autonomic nervous system testing, or even a really smart doctor that relies on lab work, they would have never found her. You would have never thought that that was what was wrong with her. But when you know how to do the testing, you can find these things. And it leads you right down the path. And sometimes you're, you're in three deep, sometimes you're in ten deep. You just keep going. The body will tell you what's wrong. You handle it. And then you get a well patient. All right, this is 2001, and this was really an epiphany for me. Um, I learned about teeth, but I wasn't, I was scared to send someone to a dentist um, uh, because I thought that then if the dentist did what I said, they would come after me if there was a problem with it. And I wasn't certain of it myself. And this is one of the cases that really convinced me. Uh, at that time, I was doing part-time work in a chiropractor's office. He has this, this, this uh, machine called a Vax-D. And it's a way to sort of um, fix herniated discs in the low back. And he needed a doctor to do physical exams on his patients because then he could bill insurance for it. So I would go over there one afternoon a week, and he would line up all the people who were candidates for this, and I would do their physical exams. So I was familiar with the machine. And at the time, about 80% of the time, if they had a herniated disc, their disc got better, and their symptoms got better. And I believed in the treatment, and it was really good. So there's a guy in there, and he comes in. He comes in, he gets out of a taxi cab, and he's crawling into the office because he can't stand and walk because he's got such terrible back pain. And he had had an injury nine years before. He was a HUD carrier, so he's, he's got, he's got you know, plaster on a thing, and he's climbing up ladders all day long. He's in the peak of health. He's strong as an ox. And one day, he bends over to tie his shoe. He gets acute pain in his back, and his, his, um, his back blows up. And on MRI, he's got a herniated disc, and he's got radicular pain, and it looks like that's what's wrong with him. But he refuses surgery. He's a natural guy, and he'll juice until he dies. He's another one of these guys. He'll juice until he dies, but he's not going go to go to the orthopedic surgeon to get his back fixed. So he comes into the clinic, and we do the 25 treatments on him on Vax D, and nothing changes. And we felt sorry for him because he's out of work for nine years and said, okay, we'll just give you another 25 treatments. Okay? So we ended up with 72 treatments, and he wasn't, he wasn't any better. He's still crawling in and out of his office. So in the meantime, I had learned how to do prolotherapy. Uh, it's using a, a glucose or ozone as an injection to treat pain. And I said to him, maybe I can help you with that. So why don't you come over to the office, and I'll do some uh, prolotherapy on your back, and maybe that'll help you. So he comes to my, my, my regular office, and I said, before I treat you, I want to just do my autonomic response testing exam on you to see if there's anything else. And he tested for um, root canal toxicity. So I said, before we do anything with your back, I'm going to send you a couple blocks away to the dentist. I want to get x-rays of this area. This is before the cone beam CT. It was just a regular standard dental x-ray. And the dentist called back and said, the tooth is really abscessed, and there's a big problem there, and it needs to be removed. So he comes back to me, and he says, what should I do? And I said, hey, listen, what happened? What's the story on this tooth? And he said, well, that tooth had pain, and I went to the dentist, and he did a root canal on me. He left a temporary on there. During the whole procedure, I got this feeling like something wasn't right, but I didn't know what it was. And he said, the night I got home after the procedure, it bothered me, and so I went back to the dentist the next day, and I said, you know, I'm not going to sue you. I'm not mad at you, but I got this feeling in my stomach that something isn't right. Would you just reassure me or check it or do something? 
And the dentist blew up and threw him out of his office. So nine years later, he still has the temporary because he never went back. I said, did that procedure precede the back going out or was it after the back went out? He said, oh, it was maybe a few days or a few weeks before the back went out. Okay. So now the dentist takes him in there. He pulls the tooth. He's got an open cavity to his sinus. He's got, uh, you know, 20 cc's of pus that comes out. I had him on IV antibiotics for a month because there was just osteomyelitis everywhere. But after about four weeks, and he's coming into my office every day for the IV treatment, he's like, I don't know, but my, and he's walking in now. My back's, my back's all right now. I don't feel the pain. And it healed his back. And about a month after that, he knocked on my door and he said, I've been out of work for nine, days, for nine years. I need a job. Will you give me a job? And we were moving offices. And I said, the only thing I have is we got to move everything in that office to this new office. If you want to help, do it. And he did. And he was fine. He was lifting boxes. He was fine. Uh, after that, he, he decided to do something else. But I got a Christmas card from him about a year later. It was a picture of him and his wife on the top of Mount Kilimanjaro. He says, back still good. I climbed all the way to the top. Thank you for saving my life. And that was for me like, holy cow. Teeth do do other things. So that improved my bravery. So you've probably all seen this. As, a, I, as an infectious disease doctor, we would take specimens and we would do a brown and brem stain. It's a, it's a stain for bacteria. On the left is a vital tooth. It's probably a wisdom tooth that got pulled for no reason. 1.1% um, of the tubules are stained brown, so there's a little bit of bacteria in there. On the non-vital root canal tooth, 39% of, the, of, the, of the, uh, the dentin tubules are infected. For some reason, this doesn't make sense to dentists. I, you know, not like you, but regular dentists. It doesn't make sense to microbiologists. It doesn't, it's just like it just goes over their head. Here are the biofilms in the dentin tubules. They're just like, it's like not subtle at all. Okay, so next case, 44-year-old. She's a fitness instructor. She's in great shape. She walks into my office on a first visit, leaned over, and she's got one of those those four-pronged canes that old ladies use. And I look at her med list, and she's on OxyContin round the clock for pain. So I said, what happened? She said, I'm coming in because I want to have prolozone therapy for my back because nothing's working. So when did you hurt your back? She said, I never did hurt my back. I don't know what happened but my back started to hurt last fall. This is like May. And I went to the orthopedic surgeon and he did an MRI on me. He said I had a herniated disc and he did a discectomy on me. He cut off this overhanging disc. And then a month later, I said, how did that go? She said, it didn't go well. My pain was worse. And I went back to him and he did a two-level laminectomy. Now, laminectomy is they cut the, the pedicles on both sides of the vertebral bodies and take off the spinous process in the back part of the bone so that the nerves coming out of the spinal cord now don't have to go through a small hole. But it completely destabilizes the back, and she had L4-5 and L5-S1 done as a laminectomy. And one of these people, if you take your finger and you push it into their low back, you go all the way down to the bottom. Okay? It's a deforming, it's a disaster operation. Maybe sometimes it has to be done, but I said to her, well, how was it after that? And she said, you can see me now. And now what he wants to do is fuse my spine. And I wanted to see if anything else would work because I'm a mess, I can't work, I'm a fitness instructor, my life is terrible. Okay? So I said, okay. I remember the guy from 2001. Get on the table. Let's retest you. And I test her, and what comes up on the autonomic response testing is jaw osteitis. So I said, jaw osteitis, have you had dental work done? Is there anything going on? 
She said, I had a root canal, and it didn't work, and he redid the root canal, and it still hurt, so he pulled the root canal, he put a bone graft in, and he put an implant in. Now she's 10 grand into the dental treatment. So I said, how is the thing feeling? She said, well, if I bite down on it, it's still uncomfortable. So I said, well, what does a dentist say about that? And he, she said, well, it could take up to a year to really fully seed and be really good. So, and it's only been nine months, so give it some more time. I said, okay. So when I check that tooth, it's weak. And I do an old trick I learned from, um, if you know Robert Rowan, it's an old trick I learned from Robert Rowan, which is I took some procaine and I blocked the tooth. And I said, I'll be back in 15 minutes. I want to see if this has any effect on your back pain. And I came back in 15 minutes. I went and saw somebody else. I came back in 15 minutes. And she is now standing with no cane next to the table. And she's doing this. And she's looking at me like, that pain is really better. I said, OK. I think this is connected to that. But I'm so worried that it, this might just be like a psychological reaction that I want you to come back in three days and we're gonna do it again. So she came back, I did it again, it worked again, and that afternoon she went home and she was vacuuming. Now, if people with low back pain don't vacuum because it's too stressful on their low back. And she calls me that afternoon and she says, I'm vacuuming, I know this is what's wrong, I want it out. I said, let's do it one more time. <laughs> she said, no. I said, well, then let me call the oral surgeon and tell him what's happening, because otherwise he's going to think that both of us are crazy. So I call the oral surgeon, and I talk to him, and he's actually really good. And he said, well, I've, re I've seen referred pain before, because sometimes people get headaches, but I haven't seen this. He said, let me laser it a few times, because it's going to be a big job to get that thing out of there. So he lasers a couple times. It actually made the pain worse. And she ends up having the tooth pulled. And within six weeks, her back pain is like 80% reduced. And I did some prolotherapy on her back, and she went back to work. Now, these cases are not, these, she just happened to hit me who knows about this, which was her good luck. Because there's not another doctor in my town that would be looking this way or finding this. And it's really important because it, made it, it, it saved her life. So next one is a little bit different twist. She's a female business owner. She owns a Merle Norman studio in the best part of town where I live. She's very successful. She's had chronic headaches for 25 years. And she's taking 20 to 25 Tylenol a day so she can get through her work day. And she comes in, and she's got some big amalgams in her mouth. And I take out my trusty Radio Shack voltmeter. And I put it on millivolts, and I put one electrode on the amalgam and the other electrode on the, tea, on the cheek. And I measure 350 millivolts of direct current that's going into her jawbone, into her brain, 24 hours a day for 25 years. This isn't her, but, and you probably can't see it. <laughs> this is another guy. He's got, I think it's 256. I can't see it from here. 241, okay? A nerve fires at 70 millivolts. That's the normal threshold for a nerve. And when you've got in the hundreds, you are, you are putting bad energy into the brain all the time and there might be referred pain or symptoms just from that because you're gonna get autonomic screw-ups. If you think of it for a minute, our, the mitochondria in our cells are the areas where energy is actually created. And it runs on little ion movements. You know, you're moving electron, electrons around. The energy level is very low. And you put this kind of energy into those systems, you can get some screwed up stuff. So I sent her over to the dentist. 
He took out the one that measured the worst first. And she came back and said to me, by the time I got from the operatory to the front to pay, my head pressure had disappeared. Case solved. You know, she got the rest of her amalgams out. Case solved. So she comes back a few weeks later and she says, you know, I've been thinking. My husband, the two days after we got married, had some kind of a partial stroke, semi-stroke. Nobody could find anything on his MRI. But he's been wheelchair-bound since. He's pretty much non-functional. He's in a nursing facility all day while I'm at work, and then at home, when, when I come home, I take care of him. And we've been at this for, I don't know, 20 years. Do you think maybe something like that is going on in him? Sure, I don't know. Let's take a look. So he tested autonomically for, for mercury, and I sent him to the dentist. And when the dentist did the x-ray of his jawbone, they found a bullet-sized piece of mercury that had been placed in the jaw as a spacer about a week before his brain went dead. And the dentist removed it. By then, there was just so many dead and messed up neurons. He never really got, got improvement from it, but it was like the grossest malpractice you could ever do. But I think these toxins are real. They affect people. We have different sensitivities. If you find it, there's a chance you, the, you can help the patient. This one is really interesting. This guy's 25 years old. He walks in my office. He's six foot nine. He's playing semi-pro basketball. He played 1A ball um, at a major university. He lives in New Jersey. He just got driven down by his mom in their station wagon because I had helped one of her family members, and he was having trouble, so she drove him down to see me. The story was he was doing fine, and then he had what looked like an acute stroke. He went unconscious. He, he, was, he was paralyzed on one side. He got, um, he got his deviated eye movements. He was put in the ICU. He was in there for a week. They did a, the MRI in his brain. They thought they'd had a stroke. After one week in the hospital, she puts him in the car and she drives him down to see me. So I do my routine. Get up on the table. Let's see what we can find on you. His autonomic re uh, re uh, response testing showed root canal toxin. It's a mixture of mercaptanum and and sulfur ethers and all kinds of stuff that bacteria do and ground up dead teeth that are infected. These are the vials that I use. And he tested for that. Now on his intake sheet, I have, a, I have a whole section on dental, but he hadn't filled it out. And I said, have you got any root canal teeth? He said, yeah, I got, I got, I got one. This one. It's a frontal lobe tooth, this one. What happened? Well, you know, I'm basketball, and I get an elbow, it knocks out my tooth, or breaks my tooth, and I, and I have a root canal. It's about three years ago. Okay, go to the dentist. He goes to the dentist. It turns out that the tooth was abscessed. The dentist pulls the teeth, irrigates it with ozone, takes out the periodontal ligament, does the whole shtick, puts in PRP in the space, and then he goes to my IV room for ozone and all the stuff that we do, and I'm not scheduled to see him for six weeks. Now, when he came in, he's wearing an eye patch the first time I saw him. He's six foot nine. He's got big dreadlocks, long beard, and he looks like, and he's New Jersey. You know, he's Joyzy. He's one of these Joyzy boys, like attitude. And he, um, he looks like Blackbeard with his patch. Why are you wearing the patch? Because I'm seeing double all the time as a result of the stroke that I had. So he comes back at six weeks. He walks in the office. He doesn't have his eye patch on. So I said, what's with the no eye patch? He said, well, I don't need it. I can see. He said, in fact, everything's good. Yeah, I feel good. And I want to release to play basketball. 
So I said, we can't do that. Let's finish the IV program. You go home for a couple months. You just chill. You come back here. We're going to repeat your MRI, and we're going to re-examine you and make sure everything's okay. At which point, everything was okay. He was fine. It's a year and a half. Um, he's fine. He's completely fine. Can you imagine his life at 25 with his diagnosis of a stroke and probable MS? What they would do to him because nobody's looking or knows teeth? So you can profoundly change people's lives, and it can come from both the people you see and, of course, the people I see. And honestly, my partnership with my dentist is my most important thing. Like I said, I probably send eight or ten people a week there for cone beam CTs. And what I found is that autonomically, when I do the testing, there's a 99% chance when it comes up as the primary item when I test someone, he's going to write me back. He gives me a beautiful like radiologist report where he goes through all the things on the mouth that you can see, and then there is abscess there 99% of the time. So I've been doing this for a while. I'm really good at it, but anybody can learn how to do this. And it makes a big difference. Because now I know, I don't ever even think about it. Look, it's a terrible thing. I wish there were better ways to do it. I don't know of a better way to do it, but I know that I'll never get you better unless we handle this. And if we handle this, there's an 85 or 90% chance that you're going to get better and your symptoms will go away. And it almost doesn't matter what you come in with unless it's really way, 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 way too late. Okay? You've probably all seen this. Um, this is all the crap that's in those things. It's all the bacteria. So, oh, and I had one, I just had one that's just, I didn't put it on the slides, but um, this girl is 20 years old. Her parents are missionaries over in Malaysia. It's really bad over there. The medical care there is really bad. And she's 20 years old, and she's got about a two-year history of increasing nausea, increasing vomiting. She's gone from 120 pounds to 79 pounds. She's looking like she's just going to die there. And this, 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 the, the mother and father, the missionaries, have another, besides that one, have another eight or ten children in Kentucky. And I have been taken, taken care of those, some of those children for a long time. And so they said, we're afraid, her name's Faith, we're afraid Faith is going to die. So the mom gets on a plane with Faith, and they come to Clearwater, and I examine Faith. And Faith comes up as her primary thing, jaw osteitis. Three years before this, which was about a year before her symptoms started, she had all four wisdom teeth removed. So I sent her for the cone beam. And the Hausman units are really low in two areas. So there's no bone there. It's, it's open. There's a cavitation there in two places. And so the dentist operates on the cavitation. Now, the other symptom that this girl had was five to eight seizures every day. And the parents are non-standard, and they're not medicating her for her seizures. I don't think that was very smart, but that's just how they are. From the day she had the cavitations done, big, deep ones, she didn't have a seizure for a week. And she started to eat. On the eighth day, she had a seizure. Back to the dentist. Have him ozone it, to clean it, do it, re, you know, something happened in there. He redoes it. She's seizure-free. She was in our town another four or five days. She gained four pounds. She's eating. She's fine. She's now back in Malaysia, and she's fine. There's another one. These are young people. You, I, I, would, I wouldn't have ever suspected this prior to this rendition of my life, but there you go. So these are, these are, just, these are things dentists can pick up if they're savvy to it, and a lot of you guys do this anyway, so you know it. I'm just agreeing with you. So with any severe chronic illness, you know what I find is that we, a lot of people that end up in my office have seen 12 or 14 people, and they're not well. And when I see them come in, the first thing I look at is the dental history part of the, we have a, a whole series of, of information that they fill out about their health history, and one part of it is a dental history. And if they're chronically ill, bad. And I go there, the first thing I look at, root canal, Good, we got this one. 
because the other 14 guys didn't think of it, didn't know it, didn't explore it. And I know that if that's there, we're home free. They're going to get better because it's the big one at the bottom of the pile. 80% of the cases I refer for, for Dennis. I bought this guy two CAT scans so far. Okay, so what are the dental problems, the big ones? It's root canals, abscesses, gum disease. Um, here's another one, I just thought of this. Lady with Parkinson's, she's 63, she's successful. She's on Parkinson's drugs for nine years. As you may or may not know, the drugs for Parkinson's can give people temporary relief, but the body tends to not be able to utilize them, and they have a steady downhill progress, and they, they, they get an infection or something, and they just go downhill. They end up in a nursing home. So she'd been on for nine years. The drug worked initially. Now they're not working anymore. And so she came in for a second opinion. Her neurologist's workup consisted of an MRI of her brain, yes, consistent with Parkinson's, and L-DOPA or one of the variants of that with a CBC and a, and a CMP and looks like you're fine. So she has nine infected root canals. She has, we test people for mold toxins because Florida's moldy and there's a lot of places where people live where there's mold and the mold toxins aerosolize and it gets in their body. She's got four out of four mold toxins at like six times acceptable level. She's got Epstein-Barr viruses, two parasites, uh, deficiencies of amino acids and several vitamins and several minerals. I've got a list like seven long of major things wrong with her body that the neurologist was just clueless on that give her a chance to actually heal and get better when the right things are looked at. So nutritional deficiencies, vitamins, essential fats, minerals, amino acids, occult infections. This is interesting. I am speaking at ACAM um, next month. And um, there's a lot of guys there that are doctors who, who treat Lyme disease. And a lot of the people who treat Lyme disease are a member of this group called ILADS. And ILADS is a group that treats, it's, a, it's an organization, it's a medical organization that treats people for Lyme. And the treatments are generally antibiotics and more antibiotics and more antibiotics and longer antibiotics and then some more antibiotics just in case you didn't get enough antibiotics. That's the treatment. That's the approved treatment for Lyme. If you even find the antibodies in the person's blood that you can even make the diagnosis, which is tough in a lot of cases. In my experience, I used to be an infectious disease doctor, so I have given people in hospital with serious infections gobs of antibiotics. And I don't have anything against antibiotics. If the person's life-threatened and you have to do it, well, we give them antibiotics. But if you look at, this, at it this way, the things that people get, all of these are really their stealth-type infections. You know, when you get Lyme, 99% of people that I talk to never had a tick bite or a mosquito bite or a bullseye rash or a flu or flu symptoms at all. If they did, it was many years ago, and they have no idea, why, why have I got Lyme disease now? And as was said earlier this morning, Lyme disease is pandemic. It's in every country, it's everywhere. And if you do super sensitive tests, I think this is Blanche's lab that did this, of testing normal people for very, very sensitive tests that test for Lyme, you can find it in a lot of people who have no symptoms at all. So these are stealth infections. You gotta have other, 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 other big stuff going on before you actually get people symptomatic. See, when I was an infectious disease doctor, if someone came in with um, flesh-eating strep, now that's a real bacteria that will kill you unless you take antibiotics. I saw a couple cases of plague when I was in California. So the rodents in the area, in the brush in California, were infected with plague. And, and I saw a kid, he came to my office. And there was an alert from the, from the MMWR, from the, the, the disease control people. We'll be on the lookout for plague because we're seeing some cases. And this kid came in, he was three years old. He came in looking bad. 
He had a bubo, which is a big lymph glow, uh, node, in his, in his um, inguinal area. And his blood pressure was very low, and I thought, oh my God, maybe he's got plague. And we give him a shot of penicillin, and I put him in my car, and I drive him three blocks to the hospital, and by the time we got to the hospital, and he's in a crib, he's dead. Like, these are like real, real, real infections. And they require real, real, real treatment. Lyme isn't like that. You can look at Lyme on a microscope on someone's blood, and the immune system could care less that these things are swimming around in the guy's blood, and he's got millions of them in his blood, and they're swimming around. You can see them. They're spirochetes. They have a very characteristic picture on Darkfield. You can see them, and the body could almost care less that the thing is even there. They pass tissue planes, they pass into cells, they get into fibroblasts, they, they breach the blood-brain barrier. They're not invasive, toxic organisms unless you've got bad teeth or something else bad. And just like with the cancer people, they don't get better till you fix the dental aspect. So at the top of the list is dental handling. Most of them have bad guts. Um, some of them have hormone problems, deficiencies for sure. They have chronic infections. So we, we have a multi-system approach to, to handling them. Um, we use amino acids and other supplements, ozone, pulse magnetic field. Um, we're, we're the largest ozone clinic in the United States. Uh, we do about 8,000 treatments a year. So we have a great experience with it, and it really helps people. Um, but if you don't fix their teeth, it doesn't work. About 85% of our patients have major improvement. Most are able to wean off their therapies, whatever they were. Most normalize uh, as long as they do the treatments. So it all comes down to this. I'm going to check your teeth, OK? Boom. What we want to do is turn this into that. Snoopy, someday we will all die. True, but on all the other days, we will not. So enjoy. <laughs> I think we have some time for questions. Yeah, any questions? Are you all shy? Oh, thank you. OK, good. What is this um, machine that you're using? I'm new to all this, so I don't really know if this is a commonly used machine. Well, the, the machine, we, do, we actually do both on everybody. The machine is a, um, there was a German physician in the late 40s, early 50s named Voll. And Vol was a German regular medical doctor, but he also had training in acupuncture. And he got the idea that since there are these meridian pathways, if you put a small amount of electrical current in an acupuncture point, and you put a neutral electrode, an electrode on the other side that the patient held, and you ran it through a galvanometer, something that would measure electrical resistance, that if the meridian itself was healthy, on his machine it would register between 45 and 55. But if you put it on a meridian that was either very inflamed or very atrophied, it would read either way high, it might read 80 if it was inflamed, or it might read 20 if it was atrophied. And he had a plate that was also part of this circuit. And one day he's testing somebody who had um, a um, heart meridian point that was very low. And the person was suffering from congestive heart failure. And he put some foxglove leaf on the plate just to see what would happen. Foxglove is now the modern day drug, digoxin or lanoxin. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's one of the treatments for congestive heart failure. It's a heart tonic. It makes the heart muscle beat better. And when he put the foxglove leaf on there, the point went from 20 to 50. And so he started using it to test people 
for what was wrong with them energetically, and he would test all 12 meridians, find the one that has, was the, the one that was the worst, and then test all, all, all kinds of stuff. And that therapy became known as EAV, electroacupuncture according to Vol, which was his name. Now, if you fast forward this to now, there are companies that make these machines where it's all computerized. In the computer, there's a database in the one we have of 16,000 different infections, vaccines, drugs, toxins, dental stuff. And when the technician goes meridian by meridian on the hands and feet, we find out what's the biggest bad area and then screen that against infections, toxins, vaccines, drugs. And then we can make a homeopathic out of those things and then give it to the patient to take orally and they will detox that stuff. So a person who's pretty sick might have 40 or 50 things that come up, all different kinds of infections and past stuff that they've had stored in their system. And after they take the homeopathic and we recheck it, those things won't be there anymore. And they'll say, gee, my sweat smells funny or my stool smells funny or my breath is funny. Like they get, it will detox them. Some people are very sensitive. They can't take the normal dose. We just have to give them a little bit. So I do that on everybody too because I find that's very helpful because you're looking for all the information that's related to the autonomic nervous system, and this is really testing the autonomic nervous system in kind of an electronic way. Yeah. Thank you for coming and, and actually telling stories of your experiences. I think a lot in this room, we see those patients all day, all day long. Yeah. And it's such an exciting time. I mean, that's, that's why I keep doing this, because it's, it's all about the patients getting well. They come in and they, they're crawling from the, front, from the front of the door, and after the surgeries are done, they're walking out or they're they couldn't walk and now they're running 5Ks. It's just fun to hear your story and your side of it. So we appreciate what you do. Thank you very much. I love sharing it. I would like to ask for those of you that have been coined. Do, do you have a question? Oh, I'm so sorry. Not that I'm sorry you have a question. <laughs> have you seen uh, manifestations in the oral health of patients who have high burdens of parasites? Because in a lot of the rest of the world, parasitic infections are so researched, and in the United States, they're not. Do you see a big pattern between parasitic infection and oral health? A absolutely. Virtually everyone we test has parasites. If you test people autonomically, you will find parasites. They're there, and they're, they're living, and they have waste, and they put it into the body. And while we can't test yet for parasites on a systemic effect objectively, um, if, you, if you order a, an ion panel from Metagenics Laboratories, or there's some other labs that do the same thing, if, if the guy has toxic, uh, bad bacteria in their gut, or yeast overgrowth in their gut, those organisms, as part of the problem that they create for the body, is they put off biotoxic waste, which our body absorbs, which then has to be processed and gotten rid of. In this laboratory for bacteria and parasites, has a urine test which looks for bacterial and yeast biotoxins produced by those organisms in the body. I don't know yet if the stuff in the teeth reaches, but probably it does. And you can look at the panel and say, that thing has got, you've got five of these toxic chemical things that are, um, that are in your body. And unless we clean this up and clean this up, your, your, your mitochondria are basically getting poisoned for them. The, the, you guys, some of you guys have been around as long as I have, probably remember um, Boyd Haley set up this lab at the University of Kentucky called AltCorp. And AltCorp, the, I used to send patients to, to my dentist, and they had sort of a stiff cotton pledget, and I would get root canal on someone, and I would send them over to the dentist, and the dentist would take this sort of stiff pledget, he would push it up, uh, underneath the gum to the root of the tooth and pull it out on a root canal tooth. And then he would take a normal tooth on the other side as a control. And then they'd get sent to this laboratory at the University of Kentucky and they would measure um, 
six different biotoxins that were coming out of that tooth. And what they tested it against was the Krebs cycle enzymes, the enzymes needed so that the body could actually make energy. And they had an assay where they could, they could calculate what percentage of the Krebs cycle enzymes were being inhibited by the biotoxins. And we would get the report back and it would say, okay, root canal tooth number 20, and then it would list this, the, the, I think there were six or seven enzymes, and then it would give toxicity level of, of how much those enzymes were poisoned. And they'd be at like 98%. And on the healthy tooth, it'd be maybe 10%. So you could really objectively say to someone, this tooth is bad, it's poisoning you, it's killing your mitochondria. They're not able to make energy. And unfortunately, that they couldn't make money doing it, or there, weren't, there wasn't enough interest in it, and, they, and, and, and to my knowledge, they're not doing it anymore. But those kinds of things are a bit, huh? It bought out. Is it available now? No, it's a whole nother story. Talk to Boyd sometime. It's a, quite a conspiracy theory. Yeah, I don't. I don't. I, if if they had it now, I would do it. I, I went to I went to the cone beam CT because I wanted something more more objective than the muscle testing was. Um, and I still find somewhere occasionally he's like, "No, nah, it looks okay," and then I'm not. Then I I just sort of clinically decide what to do with it. But those sorts of things are available, and I think as there's more of us doing it, they're, 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 it's very helpful because you could say to the patient, hey, look, look, this is what this is doing to your body.